Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Michael Bernie Polit? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll go through the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Rita Polit lived in a trailer in Hopewell, Missouri, with her 14-year-old son, Michael. Rita had recently divorced from her husband, Ed. On the evening of December 4, 1998, Michael was supposed to be with Ed and Ed's girlfriend, but they called and said they could not pick him up until the next day. After this update about not getting picked up by his father, Michael spent some time with a few friends of his, including a boy named Josh Sansusi. They played pool at a local store, stopped at a graveyard, and played video games at Michael's trailer. Michael invited Josh to spend the night. Around 11 p.m., the boys tried to burn a railroad tie at some nearby railroad tracks. They returned to the trailer at about midnight. Rita arrived home after being at a bar with friends. She brought sandwiches for the boys. She checked her answering machine and went to bed. Michael and Josh went into Michael's bedroom shortly after this. They smoked marijuana and then went to sleep. A radio was playing in the bedroom. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. We go to the early morning of December 5, 1998, so the next day. Michael woke up to the smell of smoke. He asked Josh if he was smoking a cigarette, but he was not. The two boys opened the bedroom door and discovered the trailer was full of smoke. They were on the floor crawling to get out of the trailer when Michael entered his mother's room. Her body was on the floor and on fire. Michael exited the trailer and grabbed a garden hose, but it wasn't long enough to put the fire out inside his mother's bedroom. As this was going on, Josh ran to a neighbor's house and asked her to call 911. Emergency services arrived quickly and found that Rita was dead. Her body was found on the floor face up, her legs were spread apart, and she was only wearing underwear. Her body was burned from her pubic hair all the way to her head. Blood was found in several places, including on her right leg, her left thigh, a light switch in her bedroom, and a sheet on her bed. A fire investigator quickly decided that somebody must have poured gasoline on Rita's body. That determination was made by simply looking at her. It didn't involve any testing. The police determined that Rita died from carbon monoxide poisoning, but she also sustained blunt force trauma to the head. The police seized a number of items in the house, like two baseball bats, a fire poker, and a large flashlight, but all those items were excluded as being used to beat Rita. The police considered both Michael and his friend Josh suspects. Neither of the boys had blood on them, defensive wounds, scratches, or the smell of gasoline or any accelerant. The only evidence that made them look guilty was the fact that they were in the trailer when the crime occurred. The boys were interviewed separately and offered stories that were consistent with one another. Michael was interrogated several times. He did not have an attorney. His father was present some of the time, but his father was also a suspect. As the police were interviewing Michael, they became convinced that his behavior was unusual. They said he did not have the right emotions. Therefore, they believed that he was being deceptive and must have been guilty. He also made a few statements that they thought were unusual. He wanted to know who was going to get his mother's pickup truck and who was going to pay for her autopsy. The police administered a pseudoscientific test called computer voice stress analysis, which I guess is supposed to magically determine if a person is lying. The police repeatedly accused Michael of committing murder. The police said that Michael was calm, except when they were calling him a liar. Michael's shoes were examined by a dog. I imagine a dog with some type of special training. The dog alerted the police to an accelerant. Later, the police claimed that testing proved gasoline was on Michael's shoes. On December 7, Michael was arrested for second-degree murder, so just two days after the crime. Michael asked the police to take his fingerprints because somebody was trying to frame him. Law enforcement focused on trying to convince Josh to turn against Michael. They harassed him for years. They charged him with crimes unrelated to the murder, 
they granted him immunity, and they interviewed him repeatedly. Josh never changed his story. Years later, before the trial, Michael was offered a plea deal. If he pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter, he would only have to serve 15 years in prison. Based on what he'd already served, this would be 11 more years. Michael maintained his innocence and rejected the plea deal. Michael was tried as an adult in January of 2002. He was convicted after the jury deliberated for only five hours. Later, he would be sentenced to life in prison. Now moving to my analysis. The police made a number of mistakes in this investigation. Just a few examples. They did not initially collect material under Rita's fingernails. Her body had to be exhumed to collect those samples. Michael's clothing was never properly tested. And the police evidence room was very disorganized. We see that Michael's defense didn't do him any favors. The defense only lasted half a day, calling just three witnesses. Josh was not one of those witnesses. The defense did not challenge any of the state's assertions or present evidence regarding alternative suspects. This brings me to the question, was Michael guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that he was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Michael and Josh were in the trailer at the time of the murder. Michael had a prior interest in fire. He was observed once playing with a lighter and seeming to enjoy it. He had tried to set a railroad tie on fire the night before. Michael had successfully set fire to his own leg while burning a bottle a few days before that. The state claimed that testing showed Michael's shoes had come in contact with gasoline. The state said that Michael demonstrated an emotional response inconsistent with being innocent. He was emotionless, cold, and had no remorse. Michael was caught trying to bring an end to his own life on January 5, 1999, while he was in a juvenile detention facility. When he was asked why he tried to do that, he said, I have not cared since December 5th. That's when they killed my mom. The prosecution insists that he didn't say the words, they killed. Rather, he said, I killed. The last inculpatory item, one of Rita's former boyfriends said that Michael once had an argument with Rita over money. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. As far as the theory about the gasoline on Michael's shoes, testing would later confirm that it was not gasoline, rather a chemical used in the manufacturing process of the shoes. The state would later admit there was no gasoline on the shoes. So this isn't something that only the defense is saying. The prosecution is saying this too. In addition, Michael went into his mother's room to help her. It would make sense that if gasoline was used, it could have been transferred to his shoes. On a path behind the trailer, the police found a fresh print that was made from a boot. It did not match Michael's shoes. Rita's boyfriend's DNA was found on a sperm stain on a towel in her bedroom. DNA from sperm found on her bedsheets was connected to at least three different people. Rita's husband, Ed, was considered a good suspect. There was a history of domestic violence in that relationship, with Ed being the aggressor. Less than a week before Rita's death, she won an award of $1,000 against Ed as part of their divorce. Ed threatened Rita in court, implying she would never get paid. When their divorce was finalized on July 1, 1998, about five months before the murder, Ed was ordered to pay over $900 a month in child support and maintenance. That would terminate if Rita died. Ed had an alibi for the day of the murder, but one theory was that he may have hired his cousin, Johnny Polit. Johnny was placed near the scene of the murder by two unconnected witnesses. One saw Johnny walking away from the direction of the trailer not long after first responders were arriving at the scene. His shirt was wet. The witness stopped to talk to Johnny. At that time, Johnny said something happened to Rita. How would he have known that? The other witness saw Johnny's distinctive truck in the area. On the morning of December 5, Michael had no cuts, scratches, or injuries of any kind, according to a neighbor. There was also no blood on him. Michael had no motive to commit murder. After finding him guilty, two of the jurors now say they made a mistake. Considering all the evidence, do I think that Michael Plitt is guilty? I don't think he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and I'm not really sure he's guilty in reality. I'm kind of torn on that second point because he was in the trailer 
and he did seem to have an affinity for fire. The alternate theories of the crime are more convincing in terms of a motive, so I feel like he scores some points in that area. I think it's reasonable to believe that somebody came in, murdered Rita, and then figured they would set her on fire to destroy the evidence, as opposed to Michael beating her and then setting her on fire. This case features some of the worst behavior by the police. Pretty much every major mistake that the police make during investigations was made during this case. Just to name a few mistakes, the police relied on disproven voice stress technology, not only to implicate Michael, but to exclude other suspects. The police claimed that there was gasoline on Michael's shoes when it was just a chemical in the shoe. They evidently can't tell the difference between shoe chemicals and gasoline. I guess they regularly try to fill their police cruisers with shoes. The police grabbed onto relatively benign information to paint Michael as a monster, like the fact that he possessed marijuana, condoms, and firecrackers. The police didn't bother to investigate any other suspects in the case. They said that Michael's calm, emotionless demeanor meant that he was guilty. He was acting in an unusual manner. The reality is, regardless of someone's age, nothing can be determined about their guilt or innocence based on their demeanor right after a trauma. There is no appropriate or inappropriate emotional response to a horrible crime like this. People react in different ways. This case is a great example of how sometimes the police pretend they are good at everything and quickly prove that they are proficient at nothing. They are not chemists, human lie detectors, mental health professionals, and they are not committed to logic and reason. When the police fail to arrest the guilty party, one would hope that the prosecutors would be the safeguard against a false conviction. They failed in this case as well. Any decent prosecutor should have known not to proceed with the charges. With the police and the prosecution both failing, we turn to the defense attorneys. Certainly they will stand up and do the right thing. They will advocate for common sense and reason. Normally they do, but not in this case. A new public defender did a terrible job for Michael. They were dazzled by the prosecution's nonsense and didn't really even put up a fight. The last hope for Michael would have been the jury. So everybody messes up in this case. There's not enough evidence for a conviction. The jury must stand up and say, no, this case is ridiculous. Even though two of the jurors have come forward to do the right thing, the mistake this jury made is hard to believe. There is no adequate explanation for their verdict. According to one juror, there may have been some confusion about Michael's middle name. His middle name is Bernie, B-E-R-N-I-E. Some of the jurors apparently believed that it was spelled B-U-R-N-Y which indicated a predisposition that Michael had for starting fires. They literally believed that officers of the court would call a defendant, Bernie, again B-U-R-N-Y, during a trial which in part was about setting a fire. Like the lawyers were trying to give them a subtle hint. Like they would ask the defendant on the stand, tell me Bernie, are you hot today? As they wink at the jury. Have there been a lot of trials where the defendant's middle name gives away the expected verdict? Is this some type of precedent? By this logic, middle names like Liberty or Innocence should be very popular, and middle names like I Did It, Convict Me Now, and Guilty of Sin wouldn't be as desirable. It's a sad testament to the effectiveness of a jury. The defendants now have to worry about their middle name. Although, I guess technically it does simplify the process. The jury doesn't have to worry about facts and evidence. Just look at the middle name of the defendant. Moving to my final thoughts, this was a case where everybody failed a young man who was traumatized by the murder of his mother. The police talked about Michael acting the wrong way, yet they showed no empathy and compassion. The prosecution failed to properly represent the state. The public defender failed to offer a defense. And the jury interpreted the term weigh the evidence to mean deactivating all critical thinking skills. Those are my thoughts in the case of Michael Polit. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.